This morning I'd like to deal with Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 9. Verses 1 through 9. And uh, I want to begin with a statement, and a statement that you'll see that you can put into your insert, and that is this, God, God's grace saves us through faith in Jesus when you receive God's Spirit. Now, take that sentence in for a moment. God's grace saves us through faith. God's grace saves us through faith in Jesus when you receive God's Spirit. That is a very simple definition of how we get saved and when we get saved. And it is a definition that really is implied here in the text because remember, the Apostle Paul is dealing with people that are struggling with this whole issue of how to be saved, right? And so, I want you to see this, this message, what you see in this sentence, found right here in this text when we read the first two verses of Galatians chapter 3. Notice it with me. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? All right, so now, he's about to rebuke them. You can tell. I mean, you, when you start off calling somebody foolish, you know that this is not going to be an easy or a good conversation. But he's about to rebuke them, but he begins with dealing with what they know, dealing with the truth that they should be familiar with. And so he's kind of asking them these uh, rhetorical questions and basically saying, listen, you know you're saved and you got saved by faith in Jesus Christ and you got saved when you received the Spirit when you had faith in Jesus Christ, right? So, the, so these people became Christians, let me ask you a question. When? When? According to this, when did they become Christians? They became Christians when they put faith in Jesus Christ and received the Holy Spirit. They were, in fact, Paul brings up the fact they were told the gospel, right? They were told the gospel. The gospel, what is the gospel? The gospel, the term means good news. Good news, not as opposed to bad news, it's good news as opposed to good advice, which is your second point in your insert. So again, just things you understand, and that is this, the gospel is good news, not good advice. It's good news, not good advice. Now, the reality is, especially in our day and time, people are not interested in news as much as they are interested in advice. You can tell by just turning on your average news channel these days. We've got these 24-hour news channels now. Just turn them on and find out which shows are popular. It's not the ones that have the solid, straightforward news. It's the, it's the talking heads. It's the commentators. And we like that kind of stuff. Now, I'm not, I'm not here to beat us up over it. Guess what I watch? You know, I like Bill O'Reilly. You know, I mean, I like to hear the opinions. I like to, I like to hear the commentary. And Okay? I'm just saying that's what we prefer. But the issue is the gospel is not advice. It's not advice. It's not even good advice. The gospel is good news. And the difference between news and advice is news tells you what happened. News tells you the past. It tells you this has already been accomplished, right? Advice is whenever you're telling people how they can accomplish something in the future, how they can make something happen, how, what they might ought to do. And the gospel is not a, a set of information that gives us advice on what we should do. It is information that tells us what has already happened. Now, yes, in a way, there is a lot of things in the gospel that tell us now what to do. But before that, before the gospel gives us direction on how to live, it first of all gives us historical events. All other religions, and I mean this, 
all other religions only give advice on salvation and eternity and the afterlife. All other religions only give advice. Only Christianity, only Christianity is based on the historical news that God has done everything required for you and I to be saved. You see, it only only Christianity. Now, even with the Christian even within Christianity, there are a lot of churches that have gotten away from this message and they've gotten into the advice giving mode. And they end up being these works based churches. And they will tell you how to transform yourself. But at Murrieta Valley, we are a grace based church. We're not here to tell you how to transform yourself. We are here to tell you how God is going to transform you based on what He's already done and based on what He's going to do in the future in your life. That is a total different, total different approach from all other religions, including, unfortunately, a lot of sects of Christianity. Now, let me just get practical. Let, let's, let's just picture here for a moment. Let me divide this group in half. Let's, uh, let's, let's uh, just make believe that this half over here is going to a works-based church, and this half over here is going to a grace-based church, all right? In the works-based church, you're being told how you ought to live. In the grace-based church, you're being told what God has done to you that is now transforming you so that you will live unto His holiness and righteousness. Now, here's the thing. On the surface, if you were to meet this crowd and this crowd, they would look the same because they're both, the result there is in the immediacy is that they're both living right. This one's being told how to do it. This one's being told how it's being done in their life by grace. But it, and both of them are living holy and living righteous. Unfortunately, that's why a lot of times grace-based church people and works-based church people kind of fellowship together, and they overlook the fact that they, their churches are preaching two different gospels, you see, and then everybody gets confused. Because in the short term, everybody looks the same. But the problem is, in the long term, in the long term, everything falls apart. The, the, the works-based church people will eventually burn out. They're only going to be able to keep up that work in their, own, in their own heart, through their own power, in their own ability, in their own willpower for so long. Their Christian life is going to go up and down, up and down. Their, their, their ability to, to, to live right and live holy and all, it's just going to constantly be going back and forth. And, and so, therefore, they're going to get very insecure. There's going to be guilt issues. Or some of them are actually going to do a real good job because they're just really good people. And then, so they're actually excelling while all of their friends are going up and down. And then those people that are excelling, they get self-righteous and they look down on others and get con con condemning and judgmental and things of like that. I'm telling you, friend, the Gospels are two completely different messages in those two churches, even though you and I, on the front end, on the, in the short term, can't really tell the difference. That makes this thing very dangerous. And that's why Paul wrote an entire letter to address this issue. So he's dealing now, first of all, right off the bat, you foolish Galatians, listen, you are saved. You became Christians. By the way, how did they become Christians? What, what actually happened? What was the event? Notice he said, it was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. That is an awesome sentence. In the Greek, uh, Greek scholars have had real trouble trying to just capture the the, the beauty of what Paul is saying, because, because what he's trying to do here is, is capture the fact that when these people got saved, it was because they saw by faith, they saw what spiritual eyes, they may even saw physically as the preacher was preaching or whatever was going on, this vivid portrayal, it was vivid preaching of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. This is, this is what brought them to faith. This, when they saw what Jesus had done, remember, good news, what Jesus had done, 
That's when they got saved. Matter of fact, number three in your insert, you can write down, no one is saved apart from the message of the cross. The message of the cross. Again, he said Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. At the end of verse 2, he says, that talks about their hearing with faith. These people were not told what to do. They were told what had been done for them. Paul had not went into the region of Galatia and told these people how to save themselves. He had went into the region and told them how Jesus had accomplished their salvation. He preached Christ crucified. Remember when he wrote to the Corinthians in Corinthians 2.2, he said, I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And in verse 5 of that chapter, he said, so that your faith may not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And his point was, listen, everywhere I go, this is, this is Paul's attitude, everywhere I go, I preach the gospel, the historical facts of the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why? Because that's where the power of salvation really lies. It's not based in what you can do. It's based in the grace of God, what He has done for us. And so these people heard that, and that's how they got saved. They got saved by faith. In fact, look in your insert. I wrote down a verse many of you probably can quote, but I want you to look at it. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. So, I mean, you can't say it any plainer than that. Salvation is not based on our performance in any way. We have nothing to boast in. We've been saved by faith in Jesus. Even, according to the, even faith is not a performance. Even faith is not a performance. It is a gift. Faith is not something you mustered up. Faith is something that God gave you. God gave you the ability to believe in Jesus Christ. Now, you had to believe, right? You believed that was something you did, but don't ever think for a moment it was something you did because you mustered it up or because you were smarter than the next guy, you see, or you were better than this other guy over here. No, no. You, the only reason you and I believed in Jesus Christ and someone else did not is because God, by His grace, gave us the gift of faith. Notice he says, not of works, even your faith is not of works. It's a gift so that none of us may boast. So, I mean, this stuff is very clear in the Bible, and it matters. It matters greatly. And I know that you know this. I know you're familiar with everything that's been said. And the Galatians were as well. That's my point. This is some of you saying, I'm hearing, I already know this. Yeah, but so did the Galatians when the following happened. Something very terrible happened. Meaning, I'm trying to say if it could happen to them, then it can happen to us, right? Terrible. By the way, have you ever heard of the term falling from grace? Ever heard that term? It's used probably most often by news agencies when they're reporting on some famous preacher who got into a scandal, right? And it'll be across the, the newspaper, of so-and-so fell from grace. It's a term we're kind of familiar with. Do you know that term is found in the book of Galatians? Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 4, I believe, if you'll look at it with me there, Galatians 5, 4, just, just some, something I want you to see. Paul said, you were severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace, all right? Now, we're going to get to chapter 5 later, but I want you to see the term, falling from grace, is a biblical term. The problem is, is that it is misused by nearly everybody, especially the news agencies. Because normally when you hear falling from grace, it it's kind of portrays that somewhere along the way somebody lost their salvation, right? That's not what it means at all. What it means 
is that somewhere along the way, what, this is what Paul meant by it. Because he's, remember, he's writing it to the Galatians. It means not that you lose your salvation, but you lose the essence of the gospel. So that, watch this now, you become a functional unbeliever. I wrote this in your notes so that you can, don't have to try to remember how to quote that because I want, this is, this is what falling from grace means. It means that you become a functional unbeliever even though you're still a believer. It means that you go from living your Christian life by grace to you start somewhere along the way, you fall away from grace, you fall away from that doctrine, and you begin to live a works-based salvation. You fall away from it. You're still a believer because, you remember, you can't lose your salvation because you didn't earn it in the first place, right? God, you're still saved. These Galatians were still believers, but they had fallen away from the doctrine of grace. They had fallen away from it. Now, this, my friend, is so relevant to you and I because I believe in this room most of you are believers, if not all of you. But, but listen, that doesn't mean you're... you're You're totally free from any kind of danger in your Christian life, even theologically. Just because you're saved, there's still a lot of danger, and that danger primarily can be, and most often is, is where people like you and I fall away from true biblical doctrine. We fall away, especially from the doctrine of grace, and we fall into all sorts of legalism. Now, this is what Paul is dealing with. Now, with that, with that in your mind, let's go back and start over in verse 1. He says, O oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who has bewitched you? I love that word bewitched, don't you? I mean, what's the root word of it? Witch. Anytime you see witch in the Bible, it gets your attention, you know? Witch, it means... You've come under someone's magical spell. Uh, That's what it means. You foolish Galatians. Somewhere along the way, you fell under someone's magical spell. You you adopted someone's philosophies. and, and, And now that you have all of this new ideas in your head, you can't think straight. You can't think biblically anymore. Notice in your insert, I wrote down that to be bewitched, means that you've been, you've been duped, you've been tricked. In fact, he calls them foolish, foolish because you've been bewitched. So it's not that, it's not that these people are stupid. It means that, it means they came, again, that come under a spell. It means somebody came into their life and built some trust. Or for some reason, you, you give them ear, you listen to them. Maybe they flatter you. You know, the word bewitched, there is an element in the definition of it, of flattery. It means someone's come along and they, they've, they've slowly drawn you in. You know, we watch all the little Disney shows with our children. And you know, the wicked old witch, she don't ever just show up green with all of her moles and ugly hair. No, she always has to change her look right? And then she, she deceives and she draws you in and she promises all kind of, and she talks so good about her victim and makes them feel, and it, there's flattery involved. And so you get charmed, not because you're morally foolish, but because you're mentally lazy. You got suckered. You got played. Oh, foolish Galatians, somebody's done played you. You done got played. What, what did they do? What exactly did they do? Verse 3, are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now being perfected by the flesh? So there it is. You, you started out... In the Spirit, by grace, through faith in Jesus, you receive the Spirit. And so you feel like, hey, my salvation started by grace. But now, I have to complete it. I have to perfect it. 
And that's what the word, the word perfected there means, completed. So what Jesus did for me when I got saved, when the Spirit of Christ came in, that wasn't complete salvation. That was only the beginning of salvation. And, and in order for my salvation to be completed, in order for it to be confirmed, in order for it to be secured, I have to take over and do some things. So I started out on grace, but in a very subtle way, some people came in and began talking to me and began uh, flattering me, and I got to trusting what they were saying, and now, and now for some reason, I'm no longer living by grace, I'm living by my own willpower. I start believing things like, well, what God did when He saved me is He gave me a second chance to get things right. And so I've got to take advantage of this second chance God's given me. I've told you before, God doesn't give second chances. Amen? doesn't matter how many chances He gives us, we're going to mess them all up. But somewhere along the way, a lot of people talk this way, God gave me a second chance which implies now I get a chance to get it right. So God gave me a second chance. That's grace. God was merciful. I believe in grace. God did for me something I didn't deserve. The problem is, what happens now? Because now they believe God gave me grace, but I have to take over. God God will take care of those who take care of themselves. God will meet you halfway. This is all the kind of theology that's out there. God saves you from hell, but you have to work your way to heaven. You see, God stands you up, but you've got to run. Oh, I know none of you believe that, right? No, this is the way it goes in our kind of churches. I was saved by the gospel, but I grow by applying biblical principles. How many of you, that sounds good, sounds right. (laughs) Probably some of you are going, hey, I don't see the problem yet. It's very subtle. I was saved by grace, but I grow by applying biblical principles. The subtle distortion there is my growth is based on my ability and my consistency of applying the Bible. I'm telling you, friend, this is the foundation of moralism that has taken over our churches, which is why in most churches you go to, and unfortunately even in this valley, the sermon you would hear today would be a nice little how-to sermon, how to apply biblical principles. And everybody goes, claims to be Christian because they're applying Christian principles. But their salvation, their their growth, their sanctification, their whole Christian life is based on themselves. In the short term, you can go to that church and everybody you, you would get along with, you look like them, they look like you. On the short term, everything's good. But in the long term, it's a disaster, friend. It is a disaster because they have fallen away from the doctrines of grace. Look at it again, verse 2. Paul, Paul's asking these questions. He's got to make these people think because somewhere along the way they stop thinking, you see? So, so when you want someone to think, every, you all know this, when you're, want, when you're counseling, you don't just tell people stuff, you ask questions, right? Get them to answer it themselves. So this is what he's doing. He's saying, let me ask you, this is verse 2, only this, did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? They all say, yes, yes, of course we did. We received the Spirit by faith. Verse 3, are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? So he's asking quite, getting you to think. Why why do you think that salvation begins by grace, but it is going to be completed and perfected by your own flesh, by your own works? This is the basis of all false theology. It's the basis of Arminianism, legalism, everything that's wrong with religions. The truth is, we grow in Christ the same way we get saved. In Christ, the same way we get regenerated in Christ, the same way we get forgiven is the same way we grow. Paul gets very practical. Notice verse 5. 
And verse 5 says, Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? You understand what he's asking there? He's saying, look, God's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things going on in your life. God's doing a lot of things. Now, let me ask you. This is what he's saying. Let me ask you. This God who's performing all these works and miracles and all this stuff going on, is that because of His grace or because you've taken over? And now He's doing all of that to reward you for your good works. Man, that's a good question. It's a good question. I don't know how many times I've heard people tell Christians, you know, you, get, you, have, you have people get saved. This is how it goes. They get saved. Man, they are just on fire. And they come in, they talk to a pastor, they're like, man, I want to do something. I want to serve God. I want to, let, put me in Sunday school, let me teach. Well, they're not prepared to teach yet, but a lot of churches need teachers, and, and uh, ours is no different. So. Pastors get under a lot of pressure to fill the, fill the hole. And so they say, well, I want to teach, but I don't know what I'm doing. Man, I just, I just, I don't know what I'm doing. Well, listen, God saved you. Trust God, right? Trust God. Get in there and just like God, pour out of your life. So they get in there with those kids and they are just pouring out all of this grace that's in their life. They're just, oh man, the Spirit is all over these people and they're awesome. Kids are like, man, Miss So-and-so, man, I love going to her class. It's just awesome. Somewhere down the road, they get bewitched. Somewhere down the road, when life, when the trials, when the struggles come, they stop living by grace. They stop living in that place where they're just trusting God for everything. No, now, now they're, well, they're, they're taking all of these little workshops and they're watching all these videos and they're doing all these Bible studies and they're learning all these biblical principles and, and now they, they don't even feel qualified to be teaching and they, they don't even feel uh, like they could, they're like everybody else and, and so they start feeling really down. They come talk to the pastor and they're like, you know what, I just don't know if I can keep doing this. I don't know if I should be in that class and here's the problem. Here's, here's where it happens. The pastor says, listen, just go in there and do the best you can. And a switch flips. And they go from trusting in God and living in the Spirit to doing the best they can. And their Christianity becomes flat. It becomes hard. It becomes inconsistent. It's so subtle. They've been bewitched. They listen to self-help sermons to help them try to improve. You go into a lot of churches these days and it's like the, the pulpit's been replaced by a counseling sofa. Right? Everybody just getting self-help, pop psychology to improve yourself. Well, I like what Paul said. In that first verse, he says, you know what? You know what, where you were right and where you need to get? You, you were right with God when you saw the vivid depiction of the cross of Christ. You saw, you sat under the gospel. You heard it by faith. You were on fire for God when you were in that place, in that environment, under that kind of teaching. But now somewhere along the way, you've rejected the cross. You, you, you got away from biblical gospel preaching and you got yourself into a nice little church where everything is outlined for you and you are applying it to your life and trying to improve yourself and it is falling apart. You know, one of the ways that most Christians get bewitched is they are pressured to live up to the examples of super Christians. 
There's a lot of pressure. We should live like so-and-so. Fill in the blank. How many of you read Christian biographies of great people of faith, and you get through reading it, and you're like, oh, psh, I am, I'm a loser. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm, I don't trust God at all. That person, tr- and, and it puts some pressure on us to live up to the super Christian. I need to do better. I need to do what they did. The Jews had super Christians or superheroes. The one that they always put up the most was Abraham. So you know what Paul does here? He brings up Abraham. It's a master stroke of genius. Because Abraham is the father of the Jews. There's no bigger hero among the Jews than Abraham. And so these Judaizers were going around telling the Galatians that, look, it was great to be saved by faith, but you must grow by works. And Paul is basically going to say, hey, even Abraham didn't do that. Notice verse 6. Just as Abraham believed God, not believed in God, not believed something about God. He believed God. He had a relationship with God. It was an ongoing relationship with God. He believed God. And it, that belief, that faith was counted to him as righteousness. Know then, Paul says, know then, that it is those of faith who are sons of Abraham. Meaning true Christians. Inheritance, they inherit the promises of Abraham. It says, and the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham saying, in you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. Again, it's a master stroke of genius. Paul picks out the, the biggest superhero any of them could have known in those days. And he said, listen, even Abraham was... A man, a hero, not because of what he did, but because he trusted God. And trust, even that faith, is a gift. So he couldn't even take credit for his faith. But what it was, was he just trusted God. And that faith, that trusting in God, trusting in God was counted as righteousness. Number five in your handout. Abraham's faith was counted as righteousness. Not his daily good works. Not His righteousness was counted as righteousness, but his faith was counted. This is so important. you got to think with me. Turn on your thinking caps. Listen closely to what Paul is saying. Abraham's faith was counted as righteousness. The word counted. Here we go. Watch this now. The word counted... You might understand it better if we use the word credit. It was credited to him as righteousness. Counted. It's an, it's an accounting word, counted in the Greek. But in our current modern day, it would be credited. Everybody knows what credit is, amen? We love credit, right? We love credit. What's credit? Credit is whenever, let's say... Uh, People treat you as if you have something even though you don't have it. That's credit. What's a credit card? Credit card's going to buy stuff when you don't have the money to pay for it. Can I get an amen from Mark? Amen. <laughs> credit is whenever you don't, you don't have, but that little card, because you have that little credit card, the guy at the store, he treats you as if you have something. But you don't have it yet. You just got credit. Abraham's faith credited him righteousness. In other words, God treated Abraham as if he were righteous even though he wasn't. That's the essence of the gospel. When God treats you in a way, you don't deserve it, you haven't earned it, but he treats you in a way 
that He has credited you. You see, when you got saved, justification by faith means God justified you, He pardoned you, He, he set you free from His wrath. He, we used it saved, saved from His wrath based on credit, not based on our works. Based on the fact God now treats us as if we are as righteous as Jesus. That's how we're saved. And that credit never runs out because Jesus' righteousness never runs out. We are, at the moment we're saved... We are treated as righteous as Jesus, and Jesus is perfect, eternally righteous, and so therefore everything God demands of us, at the moment He saves us, everything God requires of us has already been fulfilled. That's grace, that's the gospel, that's what faith is all, that's why God, that's why Paul brought this up. Now look, friend... Here's where people get wrong. They, they think, listen, if that's true, then I'll live however I want. I don't have to be holy. I don't have to be righteous. That's not what it, this means. Because, because you see, when God gives you the credit, when God gives you the credit, He also gives you Himself. You receive His Spirit. And His Spirit comes on board, and He's not going to let you go on living the way you used to live. He is going to transform you from the inside out, and it's not going to be because now you're better. It's going to be because now He lives in you. And so the good things that the Bible says we ought to do, we should not be doing them based on our abilities and our efforts and our willpower. We should do them based on Faith. Faith in this God, believing God that is now in our life. Uh, gosh, I'm, I want to give you an illustration. I want to give you an illustration. Um, I'm going to make this very quick. I want to give you, I just want to pick out one thing to really make this come home. Let's say you're dealing with anger and unforgiveness. Here's the common prayer. When person, when a Christian like us, we're dealing with anger, we say, Lord, I have a problem with anger. Please remove it by your power and give me the power to forgive. Because I'm angry at this person. I'm, I'm bitter. I'm unforgiving. So, Lord, I have a problem with anger. Please remove that anger and give me the power to forgive. That... Is an, that is a prayer based on a person who is duped into works righteousness. That prayer is not grace-based. Now, it's subtle, so I want to explain it to you. You see, when a person has bitterness in their heart, when they're angry, when they cannot forgive, it is because... Jesus has been replaced as their Savior. That's why they're angry. That's ultimately why they're angry with someone else. Because that someone else, that someone else is my source of of joy or my source of security, and they did me wrong, and now I'm angry with them, which means they, they are really my Savior They've become my functional Savior. I've replaced Jesus with them. So now I'm living angry because I'm hurt by them. In other words, anger is not my real problem. Are you following me? Anger is not my real problem. Anger is simply a symptom of a deep problem. 
anger as a symptom is because somewhere along the way, I stopped living by faith, I stopped believing God, and I got connected to this person, and now this person has let me down, and my whole life is falling apart. God didn't let me down, they let me down, so they're now my God. That's my real problem. And when I just treat anger like it's my problem, and I say, God, I'm angry, please remove the anger, help me forgive them, I'm only dealing with the symptoms. What I really need to do is I need to get back into the place where I've got a vivid image of Jesus Christ dying on the cross for me. He's my Savior. He's done it all. It's all by grace. And if I can get back to Him, I'm not going to have a problem with that guy. Amen? I'm not going to have a problem with him. That's what grace-based living looks like. Grace-based gospel is when a person gets connected to God by grace through faith in Jesus. And you know how they grow? They grow every day by grace through faith in Jesus. Every day. Remember in Colossians, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. How did I receive Him? I received Him by grace through faith. How am I supposed to walk? By grace through faith. Amen? By grace through faith. Every single day. By grace through faith. It's never going to change. And if it doesn't change, Jesus Christ will be my Lord and my God every day. And I will, it will have a radical impact on everything in my life. Not because of me, but because of Him. So, number six, I've got to give you all these fill-in-the-blanks, amen? Real righteousness flows then out of a, gr- a heart of gratitude rather than fear or guilt or willpower. God's grace-based acceptance of us is our true motivation to live for His glory. I don't need to fall prey to these hyper-conservative, cultic, morality pushers. I don't need to let somebody prey on my patriotism or my love for the Puritans. I don't have to somehow start living up to everybody else's standards. No, no, no. I just need to believe God. And out of gratitude for what He's done for me, then His righteousness that has been credited to me, given to me, I didn't have it. I didn't earn it. I'm not even growing it. It's in me because He's in me. And it starts pouring out. So therefore, number seven, the only righteousness that counts is the righteousness of Christ. The only righteousness that crown counts. I need to stop trying to impress people. I need to trust God. Man, I need to stop trying to please God. Can I get an amen? That sounds weird, doesn't it? I'm going to say it again because I believe it. I need to stop trying to please God. God's already pleased with me. Because he credited me with the righteousness of the one he's truly pleased with, Jesus Christ. So I need to stop trying to please God because guess what? He is not impressed with me at all. I need to get over myself. And I need to quit being fearful of people, fearful of things. And I need to just stay in a church that will preach to me the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel, the gospel. And in that environment, I will grow. 